This is the Linear Algebra Lectures video series. You can find more information about this video as well as a link to the written textbook in the description below. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more about this video series and the associated teaching and learning tools I've created for it. Lecture 30, Basis. Our objectives for this lecture are to prove that a given set of vectors is a basis for a given subspace of Rn, and to find a basis for the null space of a matrix and the column space of a matrix. First, let's recall the definition of subspace from lecture 27. A subspace of Rn is any set of vectors in Rn that has these three properties. It has to contain the zero vector, it must be closed under addition, and it has to be closed under scalar multiplication. So when we have a subspace H of Rn, a basis for H is a set of vectors B1 through Bp that has these two properties. That set must be linearly independent, and that set must be a spanning set for H, or in other words, when we form the span of the B vectors, we get H. So if you've forgotten one or more of these terms, you can go back and review. We talked about span back in lectures 8 and 9, and we talked about linear independence back in lectures 15 and 16. So one basis is a set of vectors that we've already seen. The vectors E1 through En form a basis for Rn called the standard basis. So remember that E1 represents the vector that has a 1 in its first entry and 0, 0 else. E2 has a 1 in its second entry and 0, 0 else, and so on. So why is this a basis? Well, the definition says that this set must be linearly independent, and the set must span Rn. But if we form the matrix that has these vectors as its columns, that matrix is In, the n by n identity matrix. And that matrix has a pivot in every column. And so by the linearly independent columns theorem, those vectors are linearly independent. And similarly, when we form that matrix, we get In, which has a pivot in every row. And by the spanning columns theorem, that tells us that these vectors span Rn. Let's look at a different example. Here we have a subspace H defined by this set builder notation, and we want to prove that the set containing 2, 2, 0 and negative 1, 0, 3 forms a basis for H. So again, we're going to go back to the definition. We have to show that this set is linearly independent, and we have to show that these two vectors span H. Let's start with linear independence. So we could take the vectors and put them into a matrix, row reduce that matrix, and check to see that that matrix has a pivot in every column. However, there's an easier way to do it. We might remember from lecture 16, one of our criteria for a set being linearly independent is that when that set has two vectors, all we need to do is look to see whether those vectors are multiples of each other. In this case, hopefully it's pretty clear that neither one of these vectors is a multiple of the other, and so this set is linearly independent. Now, why do these two vectors span H? We can't use the spanning columns theorem here, because the spanning columns theorem tells us about when vectors span Rn, or in this case R3. We're not asking whether these vectors span the whole R3, we're just asking whether they span this subspace. So what do we do instead? Well, we go back to the definition of what it means for these two vectors to span H. That means that any vector in H could be written as a linear combination of these two vectors. So we'll say let V be a vector in H. What do we know about V? We know that V looks like A plus B, A negative 3B for some scalars A and B. And now our goal is to figure out how can we write v as a linear combination of the vectors 2, 2, 0 and negative 1, 0, 3. Now this can be a hard thing to do in general, but we've got a little bit of help here from the zeros in these two vectors. So let's take a look, for example, at the third entries. So what we have is whatever scalar is in front of the first vector is getting multiplied by 0, and then the mystery second scalar is getting multiplied by 3, and the result is working out to be negative 3b. So what do we have to multiply by 3 to get negative 3b? Well, the answer is negative b. So the second scalar here for this to work out must be negative b. And similarly, we can look at the second entries. The first mysterious scalar is getting multiplied by 2, and the result works out to be a. So what do we have to multiply by 2 to make the result be a? Well, the answer is 1 half a. And so the first scalar has to be 1 half a. But for this to actually work, we need to make sure that the first entries also match with these scalars that we filled in. And we can check that. If we multiply 1 half a times 2 and negative b times negative 1, we do in fact get a plus b. So we've shown that every vector in h can be written as a linear combination of 2, 2, 0 and negative 1, 0, 3. And since we've already shown that those two vectors form a linearly independent set, that proves that the set is a basis. Now, in general, we're going to be interested in finding a basis for both the null space and the column space of a matrix. And we talked about null space back in lecture 28 and column space in lecture 29. So let's focus on null space first. 
If A is an m by n matrix, remember that the null space of A is the set of all vectors for which A times x equals 0. And we want to find a basis for the null space of A. Well, we talked in lecture 28 about how to find a spanning set for the null space of A, and that's half of what we need. We need a linearly independent spanning set, but let's start off by finding a spanning set and see if we can tell what to do to make a linearly independent spanning set. Let's find a basis for null of A, where A is this matrix, but we're going to start by finding that spanning set using the process that we learned back in lecture 28. So we start by row reducing A, because remember we're trying to solve the equation AX equals 0, and then we rewrite each row as an equation. We solve each of those equations for the basic variable and write our general solution, which you can see here. Then we want to write this solution in parametric vector form. So we set up the vector whose entries are the solutions, where we write each free variable equal to itself. And then we split this apart. We get one vector for each free variable. And that gives us these three vectors, which form a spanning set for null a. But is it a basis? Well, it turns out that the answer is yes. Let's try to understand why. So what we need to know is why those three vectors are linearly independent. Well, what we're going to find when we find our parametric solution is we're always going to have one vector for each free variable. And if x sub j happens to be one of those free variables, then that vector that has xj in it is going to have a 1 in its jth position. And all of the other vectors in my parametric solution are going to have zeros in their jth position. And so if a linear combination of those vectors happens to equal the zero vector, well, then the coefficient of the only vector that has a non-zero entry in its jth position, well, that coefficient has to be zero. But then that means all the coefficients have to be zero, and that would prove that the set is linearly independent. Let's see how this works out for the solution that we just had. So in this case, we had three vectors, and we had three free variables. Our first vector has a one in its second entry, but the other two vectors have zeros in that second entry. The second vector had a 1 in its fourth entry, and the other vectors have a 0 in their fourth entries. And the third vector had a 1 in its fifth entry, and the other vectors had zeros in their fifth entries. So how could a linear combination of these vectors equal the 0 vector? Well, for the second entry to be 0, c1 has to be 0. For the fourth entry to be 0, c2 has to be 0. And for the fifth entry to be 0, c3 has to be 0. And so the only way that this could equal the zero vector is if c1, c2, and c3 are all zero. That proves that these vectors are linearly independent. And this will always work. So this gives us our process for finding a basis for the null space of A. It turns out to be the same process that we already learned back in lecture 28. We find the parametric form of the solution of AX equals zero, and the vectors in that parametric form form the basis that we're looking for. All right, now let's think about how we would find a basis for the column space of A. So remember that if A is an m by n matrix, the column space of A is the subset of Rm that contains all linear combinations of the columns of A. And again, we're looking for a basis for the column space of A. Now, finding a spanning set for call A is very easy because the columns of A themselves span the column space of A. But in general, those columns aren't going to be linearly independent. So what do we do? Well, let's look at an example. So let's think about this matrix A, and we want to think about how we would find a basis for call A. And what I want you to notice is when we look at these columns, we have some relationships between the columns of this matrix. For example, the second column is equal to 4 times the first column, and the fourth column is equal to 2 times the first column minus the third column. So in other words, some of the columns of this matrix are equal to linear combinations of other columns. And we can see those relationships easily because A is in reduced echelon form. Now, what this means is we can take any linear combination of all five columns of A and eliminate a2 and a4 because those columns are equal to linear combinations of other columns. So for example, if we had this linear combination of the five columns of A, how could we rewrite it without a2 or a4? Well, all we do is we replace the a2 in the linear combination with 4a1, and we replace the a4 in the linear combination with 2a1 minus a3. We distribute the multiplication, collect like terms, and we can rewrite this as 11a1 minus 2a3 minus 3a5. We can always do this. Any linear combination of the five columns of A can be rewritten just in terms of a1, a3, and a5. But those three vectors are linearly independent, and that shows us that the set a1, a3, a5 is a linearly independent spanning set for call A. That's a basis for call A. So what this example shows us is that we can form a basis for call A by eliminating any columns that can be written as linear combinations of other columns.
and it was easy to spot which columns those were for the matrix A that we were looking at. But that's because A was in reduced echelon form. How could we identify those relationships for a general non-reduced matrix? Well, let's illustrate how we're going to do it by looking at one more example. So here we have a matrix A on the left and its corresponding reduced echelon form on the right. For now, let's just focus on the matrix B on the right, and we'll talk about how what we're doing connects back to the original matrix A. So in the matrix B, we've got two pivot columns, and notice that each of the other three columns is equal to a linear combination of one or both of those pivot columns. So B2 is negative 2B1, B4 is negative B1 plus 2B3, and B5 is 3B1 minus 2B3. And like what we did back in the previous example, we could take any linear combination of all five columns of B and use these equations to eliminate B2, B4, and B5 and just get it written as a linear combination of B1 and B3. And since B1 and B3 are linearly independent, that means that the set containing B1 and B3 is a basis for call B. Okay, so what does any of this have to do with the matrix A? Well, remember, B was the reduced echelon form of A. And what's surprising, but always true for a matrix and its corresponding reduced echelon form, is that the relationships that we saw on the right were already there. They were still true for the original matrix A. So B2 was equal to negative 2B1, but it turns out that A2 is equal to negative 2A1. And similarly, A4 is negative A1 plus 2A3, and A5 is 3A1 minus 2A3. And so that means that any linear combination of the five columns of A can be rewritten just in terms of A1 and A3. We can use these equations to eliminate A2, A4, and A5. And that means that the set containing A1 and A3 is a basis for the column space of A. So here's our process for finding a basis for the column space of A. We row reduce A, identifying its pivot columns, and then those pivot columns of the original matrix, not the reduced matrix, but the original matrix, those are going to form a basis for the column space of A. So let's do one more example. So here we have a matrix, we want to find a basis for its column space. So we row reduce that matrix, and what we see here is that the first two columns are pivot columns, which means the first two columns of the original matrix were the pivot columns of that matrix, and so those two columns form a basis for the column space of A. And that's it. So just make sure that you're using the columns of the original matrix, not the pivot columns of the reduced matrix, and you'll get it right. Thanks for watching this video lecture. You can find links to the other videos in this series and to the written textbook in the description below. If you're an instructor, you can contact me for more information about the over 300 online linear algebra homework problems that I've created for the free MyOpenMath platform.